Good morning. So, um, what were we talking about yesterday? Um, counterculture movement in Hollywood. We have already done stardom and uh, done the case study of James Dean. We have also seen what what was classic Hollywood, the golden age of Hollywood, right? Now uh, we are at a point when we are slowly moving toward the towards the new Hollywood movement. Now a uh, new wave Hollywood or new uh, uh, new wave Hollywood or the, uh, a more author based Hollywood cinema. Now before we go to that particular point, and since we have already done counterculture, I thought let's take a break from Hollywood and look at. Uh, some international cinema. So, we have already done in this as part of this endeavor to uh, consider cinemas from various parts of the world. We have already seen French cinema, we did French new wave and uh, we have al already done cinemas of Max Offels. We also know something about uh, Kaya du Cinema Critics and Bresson particularly. So, we have done French cinema. German expressionism, we know something about Italian neorealism also. Japanese cinema, which has had such a strong influence on, uh, on several cinemas of the world, especially Hollywood and we will see how. So, today I thought that we will be looking, uh, we should be looking at Japanese cinema, a brief overview, its history and then the key people and the key movements. We did have something called Japanese new wave as well, that was in the 60s and the 70s. So, we should not consider just because we do not know much about our own uh, continent, the Asian continent that uh, new wave did not happen here. We did have a particular movement called the Japanese new wave. However, while considering the, uh, the Japanese cinema in its overview, we are going to look at some of the films from the earlier period is also the silent era, the golden the so called golden age of Japanese cinema. After the new wave we will also look at J horror which is such a popular category and the Yakuza movies. Anyone who is familiar with Yakuza movies? What is Waxia? W U X I A. Are you aware of Waxia movie? Waxia is Chinese, okay, is all those action martial arts movies. Yakuza movies are gangster, Japanese gangster cinema, okay. Uh, um, and we also have Korean cinema, which is so influential, so strong. We did excerpt from Korean cinema, we will talking about montage and we did old boy, remember. Hmm. So, the key people now, one is going to be uh, Kenzi Misugachi who was also known as uh, the Shakespeare of Japanese cinema, Ozu, Akira Kurosawa and Ozu, they belong to the golden age of Japanese cinema. Nagisha Oshima, are you aware of his films? Are you, are you aware of a movie called In the Realm of Senses? Note down the name, note down the title. These are very important films and you should be aware of this category also. Nagisha Oshima and then we had someone called uh, very very uh, influential filmmaker. If you uh, look him up, you will find any number of works on him. Takeshi Kitano, he is also known as Beat, yeah. So, you can imagine how cool he must be. And then we have Takeshi Miyake, who, uh, the, who has made the popular series of Ichi the Killer. I do not know how many of you follow these films but very influential and very popular. Meiji period, so I am talking, I am taking you back to the earlier cinema and what is the Meiji period? Emperor Meiji, okay, in Japan, his dates are 1960, uh, I am sorry, 1868 to 1912, 1868 to 1912 and uh, this was a period when Japan uh, came under the influence of western arts and theatres and also visual arts. So, if you look at this particular painting, just take a minute, look at this painting. It is Japanese, but uh, do not you find echoes from the European art as well, no? 
in what way? Hmm? Okay, their attire, of course. The complete setup. It looks like a, a very uh, a, a one of those uh, Monet or Renoir paintings, okay, set in the countryside and uh, uh, depicting the world of uh, the elites in Japan. Okay, and, and look the way they are dressed up. Okay, it's very very uh, modern, very western. Now, uh, taking you back to the silent cinema, early Japanese film audiences, they were because they had they were the, uh, the generation which was the direct descendant of the Meiji period. So, they were familiar with western art and theatre. So, do not think that Japan is a very insular island and they are not aware of unfortunately, we are not aware much of of uh, these countries, Japan and China of course, we know Ang Lee. Ang Lee has made it so big. John Wu, we will be talking about John Wu, he made Mission Impossible, do not forget that. Okay, so, we know John Wu, we know Ang Lee, we also know Zhang Yumu, the director of uh, um, Hero, okay, but Japan needs to be understood in a much better way. So, early Japanese silence were intentionally vague as all things Japanese, they were vague, they were never over the top. However, there was one particular characteristic of uh, Japanese cinema of silent movies, the uh, narrator called Benshi. He was not just a narrator, he would not just tell the story, but he would also add his own touches to the story. Okay, so, you know we talk about folk theatre in our country, we talk about telling a story, the oral tradition. Okay, so, Benshi belonged to that tradition, where he would add his own personal, he, could, he would often make up the story. So, it was not necessarily what was going on on the screen, but he would also bring uh, in his own elements to the story. So, that is the major feature of the silent cinema. And the, and the Japanese were always extremely interested in cinema. Okay. They would throng to the theatres and it is important to notice that they, they were not just interested in seeing watching the screen, but they also wanted people to tell you what is happening. So, therefore, Benshi is important. This never happened anywhere else, not in Hollywood. Chaplin's cinema, uh, silent movie, they would your uh, arrival of the train at the station. Remember all those movies, silent cinemas? No one would tell them what is happening, okay. but here they were expected to be told what is happening. So, they were ex always extremely interested in cinema. Now, uh, when cinema when talkies in Japan, uh, we had Kenji Misoguchi, often referred to as the Shakespeare of Japanese films. The story of the late Chrysanthemus is often regarded as his best work, although he has uh, like all greats, early greats, he was uh, um, he went unnoticed uh, for a very long period till Kurosawa brought attention to Japanese cinema and that he happened only in the 50s. But uh, Misoguchi made his uh, films in during the 30s and the 40s. And his another great movie is Tales of Yugutsu. He got some attention from the international critics because it was always already the 50s. And in this film, he combines real with the supernatural to explore issues of love, honor, guilt, responsibility, family. And this movie, because of its uh, innovative aspects, is often compared to with Citizen Kane. So, it is uh, 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 Ugetsu is also known as Citizen Kane of Japan. Ozu is, uh, uh, of course, at the center as important as Kurosawa. So, Ozu, if you remember, we were talking about Paul Schrader, who has written book on Dreyer, Ozu, and Bresson. So, this is that Ozu. And his films 
uh, basically he is known for his gentle home dramas. So, family dramas, but very gentle, never melodramatic, never over the top, that is his beauty. Very gentle, very sen uh, sensitive movies, not uh, that mushy sentimentality for Ozu. So, Ozu's films are known for attention paid to the everyday cares of domestic life. And I will show you certain uh, stills from Ozu's films and you will understand what I mean. So, some of the recurring motifs in his works are trains, empty streets, washing on a clothesline and telegraph wires. And what do these images convey? Everyday life. Okay. Nothing is spectacular, it is not like he is showing you enormous castles or mansions and he is not going over the top. He is no Cecil de Mille, yeah, he is just. Yes. So, he is known for his home dramas. A standard theme in his films is the breakdown of the family structure in Japan as a consequence of modernization and urbanization and also the change in uh, gender roles. What happens when uh, women start going out to work okay, and then what are the repercussions of this change. He is often know, uh, well known for his pillow shots, I will tell you what are pillow shots and uh, his evocative images remain separate from his scene. So, images are extremely important, he is a poet, he is basically a poet and he, the imagery, his poetic imagery on his screen is more important than individual scenes. He is often known for uh, poetic restraint as I was just talking about never goes over the top, never mellow over the top melodramatic. Now, uh, we will come to a term called low angle shot and high angle shot. A uh, high angle shot is something shot from the top, a low angle shot is shot from below. In uh, our cinema, in our popular cinema, what does low angle shot denote? When you place the camera below. The person, the actor seems taller, larger than life. We often use uh, this to mark our heroes, especially heroes entry. So, we see the shoes okay, in the low angle shots, okay, some of you are smiling, so you know what I mean. Okay, and why do we do that? They are larger than life characters. Hmm? So, make them appear extremely significant and important. This is not the case in Ozu. He uses low angle shot to, uh, to um, uh, denote something else, but what does he do? How does he do this? He would often place his static camera, his camera, we were talking about handheld camera and moving camera and all that, panning camera, he does not resort to those uh, techniques at all. What he does is use a static camera and places it a few inches above the floor, giving the audience an impression that they are sitting on a tatami mat. You know Japanese mats, are they are called tatamis. Hmm? So, uh, we, as if we are sitting on mats, is the same eye line matching. We see uh, as if we are on also on the floor. In movies, if you watch them very carefully, you will find often filmmakers do not show do not expose the ceilings and the floor. They are taken for granted that they are there. What happens when films makers start showing ceilings or floor? Well, the Citizen Kane was one of the first movies to expose ceilings. Sidney Lumet does it in Dog Day Afternoon. The entire movie is shot with ceilings exposed. You know Dog Day Afternoon, the highest movie with uh, Al Pacino in Brooklyn. It gives an impression of claustrophobia, closedness. Hmm? When ceiling, when the room, is, the spaces are closing in on you. So, that is the impression it gives. Now, Tokyo Story is Ozu's most popular and most well known movie. You must watch Tokyo Story, I recommend that you watch it. It is one of the most simply constructed 
but also one of the forcefully told story of a breakdown of family relationships. The story is that uh, there is an old couple and they make a journey to Tokyo to visit their children and grandchildren, but then what happens as it often happens in most nuclear families, uh, the daughter in law and the son they do not have enough time, children go to school, daughter in law goes out for work and so does the son and what does the old couple do? They just stay back, they have come here to interact with their children and their grandchildren, but it does not happen and they go back home. Okay. So, now uh, shortly after uh, the old couple returns home to their small town life, uh, the mother dies and then the children take a journey, because they have to participate in the last rituals of uh, the dead mother. So, this is a still from Tokyo story, the old couple and then when the daughter in law joins the father in law in Ozu, we were talking about wires, factory chimneys, so urbanization and modernization. He would not tell you, he will just show you, we were talking about showing directors, telling directors. He does not go over the top with his background music, almost like Brazon, as austere, as ascetic as Brazon and Dre, a window shot. Ozu's other well known works include floating wheats, the flavor of green tea over rice and late autumn. And this is very poignant to bear that uh, his own gravestone, it bears just a character, a Japanese character which means nothingness, life is nothingness. So, think of the existential philosophy in Ozu and that is very much implicit in his works. Since most of you are not aware of Japanese cinema, especially of that period, so no point in asking you questions, but do go and follow up with these films, especially Tales of Yugutsu by Misogashi and uh, Tokyo Story by Ozu. So, that you must be aware of J-horror, before you arrived we were just talking about J-horror, are you? Uh, is it about this like uh, horror movies like this uh, Japanese? Yeah, J-horror uh, is Japanese ring, horror. Uh, examples like Ring, Ring 2 uh, yeah. movies. Ring, yeah. the ring is a good example. I am sure you have heard of the ring, yeah. In Japanese, it was called Ringu. Okay. So, now the most well known, most popular director for Jap from Japan, at least you are, I am sure you are aware of Kurosawa, 1910 to 1988, influenced a generation of filmmakers. Any number, his films have been adapted and reworked in several Hollywood films also. So, one of the most respected fil filmmakers in Hollywood, and as it happens, he uh, uh, in his home country, he attracted a lot of jealousy, because he was one of the most, it always happens, okay. <laughs> it is human nature, because he was one of the first, not just one of the first, but he was the first to garner that kind of attention and that kind of reception from the western world and that uh, uh, people at home were extremely dismissive of him. They never gave him his due back home in Japan, but Kurosawa as we all know is a master. So, uh, the first Japanese filmmaker to gain international uh, recognition, he is known for a very long and distinguished career. He made films till nineteens. Uh, I am sure you are aware of a movie called Dreams, yes, yeah and uh, he acted uh, alongside uh, Martin Scorsese as well, okay. I will talk about that. So, uh, Kurosawa was familiar with western literature and arts and was deeply interested in painting. So, if you watch his movies like Ran, are you aware of Ran? Yes, okay. you will, it's like, it's painterly, every shot is like a painting, you have to watch it to believe it. Okay. His first film was uh, Sugata Sanshiro and who did he work with? The famous actor, good. The Shiro Mifune, we will talk about him. Then uh, The Quiet Duel, Stray Dog, The Drunken Angel, all these movies of the 40s. 
He also employed and experimented uh, the techniques of uh, the Soviet montage and followed the classical Hollywood narrative. You are no strangers to classical Hollywood narrative now. Okay, so, Kurosawa is recognized as a master technician and a stylist and reflects a deep sense of humanity for his characters. Now, uh, he awakened the West and we are talking about his most popular film now, Rashomon, which won the top prize in the Venice Film Festival of 1951 and also a special Oscar for best foreign film. So, that is uh, Tashiro Mifune and they, together they worked on several films. It was like one of those De Niro and uh, Martin Scorsese relationship, actor, director and Jean Pierre Le and Truffaut, they always acted together. Uh, if you remember Jean Pierre Le, uh, the child actor from 400 Blows and then he went on to act in several other films with uh, Truffaut, remember? Okay, I am sure that you uh, shoot the piano player etcetera when he was a grown up kid and he had a nervous breakdown when Truffaut died of brain hemorrhage at a very young age. Truffaut was just in his early 50s, 52 or 54 and the actor he had been working on all those movies, he had a nervous breakdown. We are all often told that uh, when Martin Scorsese was going through that drug period of his, remember he fell into this substance abuse period and he would was not able to make any more films and De Niro would often go and throw his scripts on him. Let's come back to work, I mean that is the only way you can get Scorsese out of that period. And Scorsese, believe it or not, before Raging Bull was so ill that uh, the doctors told him that you have now just a few months to live. And De Niro sort of, you know, when he gave him the script of Raging Bull, brought him back from near death. So, that is the kind of relationships and collaborations you used to have and therefore, these kinds of films. Okay, so, Rashomon, I am sure most of you are at least aware of. If you have not watched it, please do watch it and uh, it really opens uh, new horizons for you, because see it was one of the first movies to explore the concept of multiple perspectives. Today, every second movie has multiple perspectives, multiple parallel stories running, you have Babel, you have all these inner two movies and all. Yeah. It also dealt with the same thing, uh, multiple uh, narrations and some of them, I think in Tamil they say… Preceded Rashomon? Yeah, yes, exactly. It is, uh, it starts Ivalji Ganeshan and uh, the screenplay was written by Anna Dure. Mm -hmm. And it has the same kind of narration, the guy gets killed and uh, three different people saying three different ways. Mm -hmm. It just kind of set in contemporary times. Yeah, Virumadi does it again. Yeah. So, that is another popular movie. So, thank you for bringing that to my attention. So, uh, those of you who are not familiar with Rashomon's plot, it is an anecdote presented four times. There is a nobleman traveling through the thick forest uh, with his beautiful wife. The wife, uh, they are attacked by a bandit played by Tashiro Mifune. The wife is raped and the nobleman uh, is indulges in a duel with the bandit and the man is killed, husband is killed as well. This episode is narrated through the perspectives of the wife, uh, the bandit, a witness, a silent witness, the woodcutter who has been watching the entire event while he was hiding in the woods and then the spirit of the dead man, he, he finds a medium and uh, through that particular medium, he narrates his version of the story. Um, Rashomon is based on two stories by Ryanosuke Akutagawa and uh, Rashomon and In a Grove. So, there are two movies, th there are two short stories, Rashomon and In a Grove. So, Kurosawa uses the description of the ruined gate and the atmosphere of the alienation and desolation from the Rashomon story and various testimonies, multiple perspectives from before the police in a rape case from Inner Grove. So, he combines, collapses two stories and makes them into one masterpiece. Tashiro Mifun from Rashomon, the wife telling her perspective and now the, uh, 
the word has become so popular that it has come to become a part of our lexicon, popular lexicon, the Rashomon effect. That means there is no single, there is no single truth. Okay, so there is no point in uh, the so-called quest for truth, going for a quest for truth. You know, there are no grand narratives. Okay, but there are several multiple tales, stories. That's the idea. So there is no truth, but everything depends on perception and this idea has been reworked and revised in several movies, particularly Courage Under Fire, it is a Hollywood movie 96, Hero Chinese movie by Zhang Yumu 2002, Vantage Point, yeah, we all know that movie 2008 and Virumandi of course. Uh, Rashomon was made in Hollywood by Martin Ritz uh, as Outrage in 1964. Kurosawa was also inspired by the westerns. Remember, we were talking about how interested Kurosawa has always been in the uh, in, in west, in western arts and culture and theatre and he was uh, in influenced and inspired by John Ford's westerns and particularly Seven Samurai that is his movie, Kurosawa's movie is a departure from the typical Jedi Geki, the Jedi Geki are those samurai movies of Japan. So, he was more influenced by John Ford and wanted to uh, venture away from the typical samurai movies, which were traditionally made in Japan. So, the seven samurai is packed with magnificent action, great acting, comedy and adventures. Please do watch it, there, it was reworked and remade in Hollywood as a magnificent seven good so uh, seven samurai again the plot and if you i will ask you if you know any popular movie from our own culture that has been influenced by this plot a poor village is harassed by a group of bandits who regularly attack rape kill and uh, vandalize the villagers ask a ronin you know what's a ronin a masterless samurai wandering from place to place in search of uh, food and shelter. So, this Ronin character is played by Takashi Shimura. He is an honorable man and the villagers ask him to save them in exchange for a meager portion of rice. The Ronin is moved by their condition and recruits a team of fighters to combat the evil elements. Which movie? Shole. Okay. So, remember Shole is not one movie, but several movies, particularly once upon a time in the west. Sergio Leone is. How? See, uh, uh, here uh, 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 a village is attacked by bandits. So, the villagers employ a wandering Ronin. There you have Jay and Viru characters and they are hired by the villagers. Mm, they, are, he's, uh, they are offered a little amount of money, that is ok. And uh, they are drifters, they have nothing else to do, right. So, they take it up as one another uh, adventure that they can indulge in, take the money, leave. That is the plot. Then they get a sort of uh, uh, attached to the villagers, their way of life and decide to stay back, fight back on, for honor, for love. Okay, That is a, a one part of the plot. But then you, so Shole also has another plot, subplot of uh, Thakur Baldev Singh and what is he after? There is personal revenge there, personal vendetta. His family has been gunned down very ruthlessly by this bandit. So, now what? This is a total lift from once upon a time in the west. Yes. So, the because you see that is our popular culture, we need to have more emotional connect with the story. So, when okay, the villagers are being looted and robbed and raped, fine. That is one thing, but then we are, for the human connection, we also need the story of Thakur Baldev Singh, otherwise the plot would not hold. Otherwise, it will just become one of those action adventure movies. What makes Shole is because it is several things, several movies. Remember Umberto Eco saying Casablanca is several. And of course, uh, attention to detail, every character is meticulously given different shades and traits. 
So, every all seven samurai, they ha, each person, each samurai has a different trait and a different skill. Rajkumar Santoshi had made an honorable flop called China Gate. Are you aware of China Gate? Not Chinatown, Chinatown is another movie by, by Polanski. China Gate, Urmila Matondkar doing Chamma Chamma. You remember the song? That is from China Gate, Rajkumar Santoshi's. It is 98 or 99. It is an adaptation, it is a reworking of Seven Samurai. So, in the end, what happens? In Seven Samurai, the bandits are vanquished, villagers are finally free. However, three of the warriors are dead out of seven. And as the villagers celebrate their harvest ritual, the remaining fighters survey the graves of their friends. So, ends very poignantly. Yujimbo, thoroughly entertaining, 1961. Again, it is about uh, a wandering samurai played uh, by Tashiro Mifun. He goes from place to place earning his living with his sword skills and comes to this particular village, where there are two business class uh, clans, sorry, uh, both fighting each other. And uh, what happens later is that uh, he, he, after all, he is a mercenary. So, he plays the two gangs against each other. And this story, yeah, this uh, we have already watched uh, several classic westerns like Shane, George Stevens and High Noon, Fra Fred Zimmerman's. So, this is a homage to those films, a clipping a uh, still from Yojimbo. So, how did Kurosawa influence international filmmaking? Seven Samurai was made into Magnificent Seven and lone samurai character as in Yojimbo, that has become uh, you know a very popular character. So, you have uh, Clint Eastwood in Dirty Harry and also in A Fistful of Dollars doing the same, reprising the same role. Bruce Willis in Last Man Standing, are you aware of the movie? Last Man Standing, please do watch it. So, Yojimbo reworked in Bruce Willis's Last Man Standing. Same story, set in a different period, 1930s America, America of the Prohibition era. Kurosawa is also known for his Shakespearean adaptation and he has reworked Macbeth and King Lear into Throne of Blood and Ran respectively. Again with his favorite actor Toshiro Mifune. And as we were already talk, talking about, he was never considered Japanese enough. He was considered too western for the Japanese audience. So, in spite of all his international uh, recognition, he was never really considered as one of them. No traditions and Kurosawa, you are aware of I believe, what is no theatre, known for his minimalism, is closed and artificial and is a uh, especially in Throne of Blood is referred to throughout the film. So, you can uh, look up on uh, the note tradition and understand how it influences uh, Kurosawa's works, especially in Throne of Blood. Kurosawa remained active till the end of his life. In Dreams, it is a series of vignettes, he made Martin Scorsese act as Van Gogh. Martin Scorsese, another follower of uh, Kurosawa, in the Crows episode. And he continued his collaboration with Toshiro Mifune's son, when he cast Shiro Mifune in his last film, After the Rain, 1998. That is the year of his death. So, coming to Japanese new wave, what was Japanese new wave? You already know French new wave, you know Italian neorealism and we have been talking about Hollywood new wave. So, there was something called Japanese new wave, a very self conscious movement. And this is uh, the closest they, uh, they come to the so called Japanese modernism. And at the center, you have Nagisha Oshima, who made Cruel Story of Youth. Nagisha Oshima is also uh, famous for his In the Realm 
of senses, one of the most uh, erotic films of its times. And uh, Yoshida's Eros plus Massacre, so those are the films of the Japanese new wave movement, immensely popular and very well received internationally. 70s on, onwards, Japanese cinema saw a proliferation of anime, highly stylized ca animated cartoons and the most popular names Miyazaki's Princess Monoke and Spirited Away, some of the best known works of this category. Have you watched Spirited Away? Yeah. So, grew, uh, anime grew out of manga comics, which relies on uh, whimsical drawings, you know, those round faces, extra large eyes and an extra small mouth. Okay. So, those um, manga comics drawings combine great visual ability, uh, beauty with fairy tale like narratives with great philosophy, Philosophic, all these tales of philosophical depth. Perfect Blue and Millennium Actress, they are also very well known animes. Tokyo Godfathers 2003 and Paprika in 2006, all these films by Satoshi Kon. So, anime as a category. J horror, so Japanese horror, this is Japan's contribution to world cinema. Why do not we have eye horror, Indian horror? I mean, do we have horrors? Except Ram, Ram Gopal Verma's horrors, what he makes. Horror movies are recently coming, like in Hindi cinema. What movies? Uh, horror movies like Raz, this movie. Okay. You know, 1920 and Raz, they are also reworking. They are not terribly original works. Yeah, so they, I mean, Raz, as far as I can remember, is a, a reworking of uh, What Lies Beneath, Michelle Pfeiffer and Harrison Ford, if you remember. It is a 2000 movie, yeah, yeah. except that supernatural, but yeah, what lies beneath also has supernatural element in it. Yeah. But why do not we have Italian horror, I horror or anything else? Why do not we have US horror? But J horror is a, a unique category of its own. It is Japan's greatest contribution to world cinema, especially in re contemporary times extremely violent and builds up a mood of mounting dread and suspense. Nothing scares you as a standard J-horror. Uh, famous names, most uh, well-known directors of this genre, Hideo Nakata, who made The Ring or in Japanese it is called the uh, Ringu and Takashi Miyake's Audition and One Missed Call and that is also, that also has been remade in Hollywood, one missed call. Takashi Miyake's blood drenched, extremely gory series of films, Ishii the Killer. It is a Yakuza gangster genre, adapted from uh, Yamamoto's cult manga, Kurashiya one. How many of you have watched Ishii the Killer? I am surprised. You know, I would, I, I was just under the assumption that in this class, people may not know Kurosawa and of course, they would not know Misugachi, who is Shakespeare, poor fellow of Japanese cinema, but everyone would be familiar with uh, Ichi the Killer. Do watch excerpts on the YouTube at least. Fukasuka, master of B movies, What's, what are B movies? In one of my earlier uh, classes, film studies, one of our MA boys did an excellent presentation on B movies and uh, he made a comparative study of Bollywood and Tamil cinema, Bollywood, B movies. So, what are B movies? You have lists, A movies, you have B movies. A movies usually star A grade, A list actors. A list technicians, A list directors. B movies <coughs> usually are cultish, okay. they will be there. You, you, uh, there, was, there were a spate of movies starring Mithun Chakravarti okay. and they had their own fan following. 
all the standard rituals are there, all the tropes are there, yeah, an item song, uh, a martial arts scene, something you know that would appeal to a particular section of society. All your leading critics will never give it 5 star ratings, those kinds of movies, they will give it perhaps poor rating or zero rating, those kinds of movies, with enormous fan following. So, Fukusuka, a master of B movies, Japanese Yakuza gangster movies. So, now since you have attended this course, remember Vakshya is Chinese martial arts films, all those wire action movies, the Matrix, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Heroes. So, that is Vakshya and Yakuza, Japanese gangster. So, uh, he has made movies like Battle Royale part 1 and part 2 and Tarantino dedicates Kill Bill volume 1 to Fukasaku's memory. It is there, it appears the beginning. Beat Takeshi Kitano, Beat is his nickname because he is the ultimate in cool. So, he is an actor, screen director and also screenwriter and director. One of his most famous films, Violent Cop 1989. So, beat Takeshi, uh, often feted and celebrated at Cannes film festivals, he has enormous fan following among the western audience. He is not just another B maker of, maker of violent gangster films, but he is also an, uh, celebrated for his aesthetics. So, known for violent gangster films, has a cult following, but now also he is very well received. His most famous films, Violent Cop, Sonatine in 1993, Hanabi in 97 and Zatoshi in 2003. And films are extremely moody, very atmospheric, swing between humor to graphic violence and melancholic introspection. So, there is a philosophy, but and there is plenty of violence, but all almost always done very aesthetically. Violence is often played out in Kitano as a kind of ritual and ritualistic themes, the ritualistic violence all often brings you to one conclusion, one theme that there is always a conflict between duty and personal feelings. So, that is the main theme in Kitano's films. Kitano's brother 2000. And Takeshi Miyake's Ichi the Killer. Look at the still for a moment, look at the scars on his face. Almost like your Heath Ledger from The Dark Knight, yes, a shock of blonde hair. What do we uh, witness so uh, for the past 20 years or so? So, we uh, in Japanese cinema, there has been a nostalgia for the golden age golden age as symbolized by Ozu and Kurosawa. So, now we have Muddy River, an, an 81 movie which was shot in black and white, almost like a homage to Ozu's films. Masayuki's Shall We Dance has been remade in Hollywood, 1996 movie uh, and it's, uh, it reinvented Ozu's home dramas. And these films mediate between Japanese and western forms and traditions. So, now we have that period in Japanese cinema, it is they are looking back to their classics, their traditional arts and also trying to build a bridge between the east and the west, still you know quite nostalgic about the past traditions. So, that is a Japanese cinema for you. I recommend that you watch Kitano's films for their very individualistic take on violence. Ichi the Killer, if you have the stomach for that kind of cinema, uh, you watch Tarantino. So, perhaps you would appreciate that, it should not shock you all that much. And uh, go to classics. Do watch, uh, I am just assuming that you are aware of Rashomon, but watch uh, Throne of Blood as well. 
we are talking about no traditions and Kurosawa. So, throne of blood and Ozu's Tokyo story.
So, thank you very much and we meet tomorrow.